Thank you that you're here with us and that we get to move our conversation forward. We completed on Friday with Joanne, and she was going to call back in. Is she with us, Jean? Um, I haven't looked up all the phone numbers yet, so Joanna, if you're with us, press 1. Your hand will go up. No, she is not with us yet. Okay, well, I had planned to start with something related to her question on Friday, but maybe we'll let that go for a, a few moments and see if we've got anybody else out there with a, uh, a question or a thought for us. I think perhaps um, so Linda had a question for us. She had I texted believe me. she's just a 541. Five, you are on the air. Hello, I hope you have your question and my question in front of you. <laughs> because you, you don't answer. have your question in front of you? No, I, once I ask it, it seems to go out into the universe. But it was something about the one of the elementary principles or one of the four elements that had to do with the hydrogen molecule and its resistance to having its electrons stolen from it. Was that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Well, it, uh, it, it wouldn't receive an extra electron, wouldn't give its electron up. And the, with oh, the idea oh, of recognizing that there's something, there's definitely a, a force involved. And to use that as a way of understanding that there are eternal forces that we cannot intellectually or with our physical senses perceive, but by observing the effects it creates, by being aware of its existence and observing the effects it creates, then... Uh, what kind of effects would that would be like, Michael, so I could have kind of a visual? Well, in that case, night? you know, the fact... Well, the fact that, you know, if we have a space and time and we start shooting electrons into that space, then those electrons are going to occupy that space. But with the hydrogen atom, you can't shoot electrons into that space and occupy it. So the, the deduction is there's something there that's inhibiting that. There's some sort of a force that we can't touch with our senses that is inhibiting that space from being occupied by a, a, a random electron that we try to shoot into that space. So what I my question is, what popped into my head was the question, is there any sort of link between that elemental force and free radicals running amok in the body? Because I understand free radicals have, have a function in the body, but whether they're overproduced um, and um, then kind of run amok. So I was wondering if physiologically there might be some link between those two phenomena. You know, in relation to inflammation, for example. Right. But that was I. There may no be no answer for that, but that just popped into my head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My brain cells do not have a link uh or a way to make sense of those two things being related. You know, the fact that, let's say, for instance, we have an excess of free radicals because, let's say, for instance, we bring toxins into the body, things that don't belong in the body, and the body tries to defend against it. But I would see that as a different principle than the uh, the one with the uh, hydrogen resisting change. So since we are all biologically unique, could we say that anything could be a toxin that it might affect our body, but not someone else's, nutritionally speaking? Well, each individual is biochemically unique, so there are going to be sensitivities. You know, for instance, in the in the drug world, they say, well, you know, only 0.01% of people have these side effects. No, 100% of people that take that drug have those side effects. It just is not apparent, except in the person who, for whatever their biochemical uniqueness, uh, makes them prone to a more extreme reaction to that particular disease process that they call a side effect. But everybody has that, would be my take. 
Yeah, that's interesting because I have just do my observations of my biology personally and what sorts of research I have stumbled across that I have come to the apparent possibility that I am a very slow acetylator, which means my liver is sluggish, and I know that from personal experience, and that um, I don't detoxify the way, quote-unquote, normal people do. Well, you might want to look at the liver detox. You might want to look at things like perhaps your use of fructose. If you use any of that, you might want to get rid of it. No, I don't. And, uh, and do a liver detox, perhaps. And liver in the, in the East is generally looked at as the seat of anger. So approaching it from that aspect in terms of mind energy and the reflecting emotions involved, uh, the energies that reflect off of that, might be worth uh, looking and seeing if there's any work to be done in that arena. Yeah, I would definitely equip that one and raise just the issue that I am uh, really looking at because that's what I use my mm. fear to hide. And uh, I haven't really what I would consider from my personal research and experience a hot kidneys, <laughs> which in the TCM is reflective of fear. Kidneys are the... Right. And I would invite you to consider that perhaps the... Um... Excuse me, excuse me, I just, my cheek just touched something. Um, kidneys are the uh, um, agent for fear. And uh, okay. somebody's trying to call me, so I just sent them to voice me. But I don't okay. know. Cool. Those... So I, I'd invite you one. Right. So one of the statements you made, I'd invite you to consider perhaps looking at the reverse and seeing if that's true. In my experience, fear does not tend to be used as much as an anesthetizing agent. My take is it tends to be more primary, and rage or anger, hostility tends to be the internally generated drug that the body uses to anesthetize against whatever the thought disorders are related to fear and whatever the trauma or pain is in that regard. So I just invite you to consider looking at that. I don't think fear anesthetizes anger. Anger, I would offer my, my understanding, my best understanding and experience is that it's reverse. Well, it's really interesting because um, my terror is so primary. Um, I've had a couple of total meltdown situations where I was sure I was going to die. And I, um, one was on the ocean on our trip across the ocean in our 30-foot sailboat. And the other was right, I remember the that. Time on the side of a mountain <laughs> where it was insane. And I think I shared that one too. So what my feeling is at this moment is that the, the, that fear is so primal that it overshadows the rage. However, what I'm discovering as I work with my rage is that I suspect there was rage because the little two-year-old or the little infant that survival is so dependent on their family relationship that um, I began to feel that road rage very small because it interfered with my primal need to be safe, to be nurtured, to be loved, all of those things which were uh, not happening. So right. it's just well, what I'd invite you to my soul self knows that. Yeah. yeah. So what I invite you to look at is that there's probably an inherited aspect of both the fear and the rage. And that, as you talk about, you know, the little one wanting acceptance, support, safety, and all of those things, and not having that would be, would tend to relate to fear. And then along comes an anesthetic to shut down the fear, to anesthetize against and bury the fear, uh, would be my offering of something to just take a look at. 
Yes, because when I had the first attempt to have a goal, a physical goal, you know, as a little two-year-old, and it got, uh, um, I don't even want to know the term because I, I'm not feeling the emotion yet. I'm working towards that. Um, then the rage wasn't possible anymore. It became a true survival issue where I didn't dare exhibit the rage. And I, I've been looking at your chart, the physiological effects um, of um, from the pineal down to the gonads, and all of a sudden it is just really your voice disappeared, Celinda. Yep. So I'm excited about that anyway. That I'm doing work with that. I'm doing the two-way prayers. Um, I'm working with an AA person on a four-step inventory, so I'm I'm doing my forgiveness sheets as I'm feeling led, and I'm seeing if I can make some sort of successful breathing attempt to do breath meditation, just focusing on the breath. So hopefully that's all helpful. And, um, Sweet, awesome. Well, and my my offering would be that you're you're never going to heal that emotion. Nobody can heal an emotion because an emotion isn't isn't is not a disease. It's a defense mechanism. Right. It's a protect mechanism. What you're right. ultimately going to want to do is ask for guidance on what's the thought disorder, maybe generational, that here right. I am at two and I'm not getting what I need, to, to invite the thought disorder to come to awareness, invite Rukka to show that to you, to process through that. And when the thought disorder that generates both the fear and the rage, you know, probably correlated but different thoughts, as you <clears throat> take hold of those, those chunks of mind energy, then the physiological expression that results in emotion will, I'd offer, disappear and that will be can where the just, healing happens. Can you just throw off out in the atmosphere some examples of thought disorder so I kind of have a get a, a feel about how what what is not that they would be it, but that what I'm asking about so when it shows up I can recognize it maybe. <laughs> Sure. Well, if you look at that chart on the physiological effects of emotional suppression, that's exactly mm-hmm. what the thought disorders are. And the first one that, you know, we're designed, you know, if we go to the uh, the first beatitude in the Aramaic Beatitudes, what it speaks of is there's a latent neural structure in us that when we're, our home is in the breath, in the eternal forces from God, in Rukha Dukudja, rather than in our minds, in our heads, and in our bodies, then there's this neural structure that leads us to happiness and well-being that becomes available to us. So that, there's the, the beginning point of that. And as you allow yourself to breathe in and look at that, what was the message? You know, there's usually a message, and it usually comes from a power person, and there are two different kinds of power person messages that I've identified. I'm sure you've heard me speak of them. One of them is it's direct. And the direct message is instead of living in safety and the presence of love, Rukha Dukucha, as we're designed to, the energy comes in that interferes with that state. And that message is usually something like you're broken. There's something wrong with you. You will never get it. You'll never be good enough. Or whatever the variation on the theme is, that's usually the first thought disorder that comes from a power person. Or the, the second way we can acquire a power person uh, thought disorder is that it's a passive thought disorder. Like, for instance, if I'm not getting the care that I need, my power person may never even had enough energy to pay attention to feeding me any negativity about myself. But I may come to the conclusion that, well, here I am and I'm supposed to be taken care of and nobody's taking care of me. Therefore, I guess I'm not worthy of being taken care of. 
So it might yeah, be those... you know, uh, so passively something we make up as a result of the interaction with our power person, but it's still a power person dynamic all the same. So there'd be a couple of examples. Oh, thank you for that, because that reaffirms what uh, tentative conclusions I had come to already about that. Uh, both the passive and the active. And then also when I look at the chart, every one of those metabolic systems are have been affected in my physiology, every one of them. I mean, right. I can go bingo on every one of those thoughts and bingo on every one of those um, um, well, the metabolic systems. The, right. The, the right. thyroid, all of those. I just lost the word mm-hmm. for it. Just sorry about that. Oh, right. I'm not sorry about that. Scratch that. <laughs> right. Good catch. Good catch. So, so then what I'd invite you to do is to go back to your personal code evaluation okay. and maybe sit and watch the videos that came with it and really get on another level what your assignments are from the personal code evaluation that relate to those early thought disorders and and then take the assignments the word links the mind shifters and such and you uh you inspire me to uh perhaps do a a project which i haven't thought of doing before just open that possibility and that is to create a set of mind shifters that specifically go with the thought disorders on the uh uh, physiological effects of emotional suppression. So I'll uh, I'll take that on as a project and and do a mind shifter for each of those, and I'll make sure that you're one of the first ones to get it. Now I would that be list. very interested. Go ahead. No, I'm complete. Okay, I would be very interested in listening to um, the different um, CD sets that you have. Only there are two things. One, it takes a lot of um, the um, uh, labels off so that I can listen to them on my iMac. And also the second thing is the financial factor. Um, I can go back and get Aramaic systems, which I've listened to more than once. And I would love to listen to the laws of living uh, and some of the others, but... Because of my restrictions, I I don't um, I don't have them, and I was just wondering if most of those have been put on the archives at one time or another, or if I could access um, maybe by searching the website the days that you did recordings of those different ones, especially on my top three, actually four issues, because I had two that were number three, um, I would uh, love to to listen to them like when I'm down at the garden or something like that. Right. Do you have Internet access when you're down at the garden? Uh, on my iPhone, but only Or phone, have your phone. Device. Have a signal yeah, you can still, can you do streaming? No, no. It's too much gigabyte for my phone. Ah. Yeah. I can do it here. Usually when I'm here, I am totally involved with um, the duties that I'm required to do, the morning radio show and uh, taxes, which I'm still working on, and things like that. Right. Yeah, I hear you. I I have a full spaghetti plate here, that's for sure. And then Understood. trying to self care in that. Yeah, you know that. You know that one. Yeah. 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 It's uh it's a simplification process all the time. What's really important here? Relationship, commitment to self, commitment to other and survival needs. <laughs> That's about it. Mm. <laughs> well, if you listen to the input of um a really wise fellow that lived about 2,000 years ago, he said those things are all the things that are effects that you really don't need to be concerned about if you do the one thing that's important. Yep. And that's make that connection to the community of love that you connect through from within. 
and that's where really the bulk of my priorities are going. It's managing that um, when it's not understandable by others who also have needs that they want me to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a juggling process, right? But we but uh, my most of my time goes to precisely what you're talking about. Yeah. And energy. Well, we hold the space. I know you do. That's why I keep calling. And, and I. Yeah, and and I might invite you to look as you say that that's where most of your energy goes. That that you know if you go back and you listen to the the recording again, that that was not on your priority list. That was not spoken as the things that you called primary for you. Or yeah, I don't think you use the word primary, but my the message I got from it was you mentioned three things that are primary to you, and that wasn't one of them. So you might just look at that, and maybe there's a conflict yeah, uh, and something to uh, to work through on that. Well, refresh my memory as to what I said that I said was the primary. Well, if you go back and, and listen to the archive, I, I don't have them memorized, but you know it was the needs of others and. Uh, I, I, I yeah. couldn't language what the three of them were, but but the the three were not indicative of what this wise gentleman said two thousand years ago that we needed to seek, and that was that community of love within us. I, yeah, I think that's where I either miscommunicated or you, you didn't hear um, the. My primary one is the amount of time I spend on seeking on pursuing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's most of where my time is put. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And that's so. I so that's an affirmation for both of us that that um, I'm doing my work to the best of my ability. <laughs> and we're holding the space for it. So extending and love in I'm your direction. Holding, yep, and I ditto the same back. So I am All content. Right. Awesome. Nice work. Holy you in a blessing. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, any other thoughts for you before we complete? She dropped already. Oh, okay. You do have a hand up, and I believe it's... Well, let's say hello to the hand. Miss Cammie, 618. Uh, Welcome, young lady. Good to hear your voice. Where do you be? We're rocking. I am, so I'm in Maryville, and Uh um, I decided it would be a good idea in all my brilliance to try to pick the riding lawnmower up over a log and threw my back out. So I had to come up here and go to the chiropractor, and Matt is in Missouri. We're getting the house on the market today, or not today, this week. Uh So... Well, hold the space go for an easy, fast, abundant our... sale. Yes, it's going to sell within a week um, for asking price. The way things are moving down there, I just have no doubt. Um, and then we're going to go to Mexico and get rid of that apartment and bring our stuff back, and we'll be down to one house for the first time in seven or eight years. So wow. our responsibilities, financial responsibilities, all of that stuff is going to be wrapped up tight for a golden cool. retirement. Yeah. Nice. So I'm and how's Alex pretty doing? Pretty excited. Alex is doing wonderful. Um, he loves, loves, loves Portland. Um, he's working for the post office. You know, not. He's kind of following in mom's footsteps, so maybe he'll go to college later. <laughs> so he's uh, so he's out of the the uh, banking world now. He is, yes. He huh. uh, during COVID, he just couldn't stand it with no customers to talk to, um, right. and so he got out at that point. Uh, well, tell him that I said but, hello and, and send my love. He may not even remember me, but uh, it's been a long time. Oh. No, you were definitely a mainstay in your teaching in his life growing up. You know, cool. He he knows Michael Rice. 
Um, occasionally, when he calls me depressed or something, I'll say, you know, hey, why don't you give Michael a listen? And he'll go, I might do that, you know, but he doesn't. And mm -hmm. he will sometime, or he'll find... When it's time, if it's time. Teacher. Yeah, or he'll find his teacher, you know. You've been... Cool. You and Sam have been my biggest support for the last 20 years. Um, cool. That well, doesn't perhaps, mean you guys will uh, be his me. support. Yeah. Uh -huh. Text me his number if that's if, if that's okay to do. If you text me his number, I'll send yeah. him some links and a, and and drop him a hello. All right, yeah, that would be cool. Um, he, I'm really excited. He's met a new girl with the energy that's changing within me. You know, he really wants to have babies and find a partner for life. And hmm. he has met a little girl that her pictures. She just looks amazing. I mean, yes, her physical beauty, she's um, mixed race. She is gorgeous, but she's just got an energy about her that's so vibrant. And I'm really Sweet. excited about that. <laughs> yes. Very cool. Uh, so, you know, I mean, he's got a lot of the basics just from growing up with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. And... So, but here's the thing. My question I had Friday, and I okay. didn't get in before the time was up. I have been struggling for over 20 years um, with the three filters. And right. my struggle is, to me, when I get into hostility, that's based in fear. Yes. So I've fear and hostility. Kind of... Fear and hostility are like Rachma and Kuba are interrelated, but in most minds they've become kind of almost. This isn't literally true, but almost an entity to themselves. But yeah, they are definitely interrelated. It's like that old uh, song, you know, love and marriage. You can't have one without the other. Yeah, they're, right. they're definitely related. Okay, and then I was – hang on a minute because I'm in a state of confusion the last few days because my willingness has not been great with all the stuff going on with the house and stuff. But uh, – Breathing <clears throat> So with that's you. like in, in the 20 years or 20-plus years that I've been doing this work and staying in touch with you, I've had that struggle, and I feel like it's kind of a key to really understanding Rachman and Kuba and, oh, shoot, what's the other one? Um, Ruka? Ruka, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yep. Yep. Um, and nope, sorry, how dude. they work together. I had said some, asked you something a couple weeks ago. And I was just in confusion and didn't really understand it, um, where I was thinking that, like, you have Rachma, and then Kuba comes in with the intellect, and then it kind of gets everything off balance. And I think you were saying it's the way all three of them work together that make it all work. Well, not the, that one triggers the other one, you know, that an event triggers Cuba and you go into intellect. That was what I was looking at. And I think you said no. Not really, no. but it's all three of them and the way they just kind of play together. Well, the way that the two filters interrelate, uh, remember that Rahma is over the frontal lobes of the brain intentions, Cuba is over the back of the brain perception. And again, it's it's one of those things of you can't have one without the other. And right. the primary over filter. Correct. Hang, hang, hang on just a second because I'm trying to write this down. So Kuba is perception and Rachma is intention. I'll send you I'll send you intention. a poster of it. Okay. And then I'll send you a link to the poster. And then Ruka is 
I mean, it's the state of love, but what is um, so in Aramaic so in perception and then what so if is we Ruka? if we start out and we ask Ruka or we ask or listen to Yeshua, he says, "What's not?" They say, "What's most important in the law?" And he says, "Rachma." So you start out by recognizing. And there's no such concept in our English language, so as we said earlier with this manuscript, we're, we're going to have to develop some new concepts and new brain cells. So we have this filter over the frontal lobes of the brain that inhibit anything negative or destructive coming into awareness by way of intentions. And that's important because our intentions are the raw material of our goals. So if Rachman is active, he says that comes first, then our goals are all based in love. I then select okay. a goal. I select a goal, and I make a commitment to it. So I, so I select an intention out of the myriad of intentions that I have, and I make a commitment to it, which turns it into a goal. Now it's a driver for perception. Okay. Okay, so now that I've got this goal based in love, and maybe I've got some rage connected to the file in my mind on love, all of a sudden, I load that goal, rage comes up, and when that rage comes up, I'm in my hostility filler with perception, so whoever or whatever I look at, I'm in irritation, and when that rouses its ugly head, it knocks out Rachma. Now I can get into negative or destructive. I'm going to attack. I'm going to you know, do whatever I do. So maintaining Rachma becomes first, which means my goals are keyed to love. And then if I load a goal that resonates with something based in hostility or fear out of my perceptual mind, that's when I want to have a personal code that says I do my work. Oh, I loaded this beautiful goal based in love. You know, I wanted this person to just cherish me, a really good goal, really honorable, awesome goal, and this person just dissed me, and now I'm really peeved. So what I want to do is I want to have a personal code that prompts me when I'm in that peeved state to say, hmm, I've just knocked out Rachma and Kuba in my mind, and now I can do something negative. I need to engage in forgiveness. So I engage the forgiveness process, and a step in the forgiveness process is, once I've identified the goal that's driving my pain to perception, and I cancel that goal, now I invite Ruka de Kutsha into activity. And Ruka de Kutsha, right. in this scenario, is this feminine elemental force in us that, by definition, if I'm willing and I invite her into activity, undoes the effects of my errors and teaches me the truth. So when I find okay. myself in that peeved state and I realize that my goal was to be cherished and then I do this really what seems like a silly-ass thing to the normal mind, I'm going to cancel my goal to be cherished after this person puked on me? Why would I do that? Well, you do that right. because you notice that when you put that goal to be cherished in your mind, it brought up that peeved part. And you can't afford to yeah. go around with a part of your structure that's locked into that peeved energy. So you process out and you clean that up. And when you're in a state of openness and breath and willingness, you remember on the worksheet there are several reminders to breathe, at the point where I've collapsed the peeved perception, I get to drop into the root of yeah. that. And now I'm asking this super processor, so to speak, Ruka de Kutsha, to undo all of that in me and teach me the truth. So now right. Ruka can open the space where I will be, instead of driven by my peeved perception, my hostile perception, I'll be back to a state connected with truth, and I'll be able to go back and go, okay, so now I'm going to reset Rachma, reset Kuba, and I'm going to load this goal to be cherished again. And if this person doesn't fulfill my goal, if I've cleaned up my mind, if I've turned it over to Ruka and I've cleaned out this peeve part, this person doesn't cherish me and I go, oh, well, I stay connected right. to love. I don't lose it to my own peeved energy because I'm right. processed through exactly. my field. So that would yeah. be how they would all work together. 
So would you say, but, so you, you said that Rachma was intention, Kuba was perception, and then would you say... Ruka, Ruka would be is, like the maintenance woman. <laughs> Ruka would be the maintenance, maintenance woman. woman. We have problems with it. If we call her in, she knows how to do it. I mean, you know, if this <laughs> peeve part goes back 10 generations of my bloodline... I've got a feminine it. elemental force in me that knows how to reach back 10 generations. And unless I decide I have a reason to keep this peeve part, because I have free will and I can keep it forever if I want, if I right. choose and I say, I'm, I'm finished with that, then I can turn over and that maintenance woman will undo it for me. me That's of it. awesome. I love that analogy. <laughs> That's just yeah, I actually, really it's like a good that. one. I had to, I haven't used that. I hadn't thought of that before. It just came in the moment. But yeah, that's that's it. Well, that's I got a maintenance deeper. crew in there. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. Um, it is. Yeah, you can bet you'll be hearing more of it from me. <laughs> cool. So thanks for the gift. Um, thanks for the question. You that's know, the beauty what of. What started me? I'm sorry. What started me back on this path was something I've heard you say probably thousands of times that stresses the difference between what is and what we want. You know, and that just opened well, the window. Well, actually, not quite. For not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Stress is the difference between the way I perceive it and the way oh. I want it to be. Not necessarily the way it is, the way I perceive it. Right. I mean, it may be in this right. situation that this person was just totally and completely there as a space of love, honoring and cherishing me 100%. But something triggered just by looking at something on the TV out of the corner of my eye, that old peeved part, and I blocked it out. And now my perception says they're not honoring me. They're not cherishing me. Right. So it's a difference right. between the way I perceive it to be and the way I want it to be. And the distance between those two pieces of the puzzle determines how deep my stress will be, how intense my stress right. is going to be. If there's a little difference, it's like, eh, so what? But if there's a big difference, oh, yeah. Right, right. That is That clarifies a lot for me. And I have to tell you, because I know we got to be running out of time. No, we're Are good. We, oh, all right. we have more time. Then. But I want to tell you that um, on March 1st, I was a year sober for the first time since I was 25. Wow. And That's awesome. And here you are 35, so been... you're doing your best you've done in 10 years, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be 60 this year. Um, uh, well, but, that's pretty um, awesome. You know, I had periods of time where I was doing my work, and I just drank a glass of wine once in a while, but then when Mark died, that went out the window. And I picked right. up hard, hard stuff and lots of it. But um, yeah. I, there was a a sticking point for me with a year, getting to that year, because I'd relapse in the 11th month a lot. And uh -huh. I just feel like, and it's been easy. Um, I've only had a few cravings, a few things that I played with for a couple minutes. And I feel like sobriety is now my way of life. And All right. I love it. And, and the only thing my that will trigger... My healing. Nice. I'm sorry. Well, when I, I went yeah, I, I hear... For the... Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. When I went to Heartland the first time, when I stepped my feet on Heartland ground, I almost left because you said Jesus. And... <laughs> My life changed that day in a way I lost what I was going to say. Um, Your first trip to Heartland and what shifted for you? Everything changed. And within a couple of years, my life was good for the first time, you know, and you know, lots of trauma in my life and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now you know, and my kids got the benefit and, you know, not as much as I would have liked, but, you know, um, my relationship. Well, when you, when you, I had my niece yeah. call me. I don't know if I told you this. My niece called me for the first time in years, just a couple of weeks after, like last week, mm. a couple of weeks after I started doing this work again. Um, right. 
my relationships are all healing, my finances are healing, my life is organized, my house is organized. It is a miracle. Like, oh, I know what I was going to say. When I walked into Heartland, that was when all the things that I learned in my years in AA made sense. Uh, all the little slogans cool. and stuff, the way that you put it, those slogans made sense. And cool. now I cool. see the importance of them. And I'm not working the steps, so to speak, but in doing this work, you work the steps. You, you work don't the steps. say I'm yeah, doing yeah. step one, step two, right. you know. And all of the promises are true or have come true. Yeah. A new freedom and happiness. So, right. So I have an assignment for you. Yeah. And that is to do a written acknowledgement to yourself of how deeply you've changed the family dynamics from what was done to you as a child and what you are now doing to yourself and to the world. A written acknowledgement It'll, of yourself for the change you've made in just one generation, which is monumental. Right. And that will be a powerful a mind shifter gift. for you. So for the yeah, well, I, I can remember all the effort you put into keeping it as tr on track as you were capable of at each step and, and to, to look at where you came from and what you went through before you started doing this work. To today, I mean, to make that kind right. of a shift in one generation is, it's miraculous. I mean, it is miraculous. literally miraculous. It yeah. really is. You know, and they think I'm crazy. And I'm the one that's <laughs> sitting here with peace and happiness and joy and a wonderful husband and great supportive friends. And I'm sorry, I'll keep it. <laughs> and I apologize. Sweet. I I take that back. I am not sorry. I'm wonderful. Good catch. I was just going to mention that, but I'm glad you caught it. <laughs> nice catch. I've really been paying attention to my language, which is moving things pretty fast, too. Like, I'm just yep. being very intentional with my language and my actions, and I, and I needed cool. to talk to you today. I'm back on track, babe. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Uh, you know, the, the course talks about how millions yet unborn will benefit from the work you've done and to make the shift from yeah. the kind of trauma that you came up in to what you're doing today is, that's a major contribution to the world. Literally, yes, energetic. and my adorable... Bringing, bringing that level of healing into the world is monumental in terms of the energy that it makes available to everyone. Yes. Yes, I, I don't mean, know if you've I've heard me. Me I'm sorry, go we got ahead. a delay going on, but I, I don't know if you heard me mention before. But if you look at historically, at inventions and patents, you find there are things that were patented in the world in three totally different countries, totally mm -hmm. different areas of the world. People who knew nothing about each other, and right. all all three patents were granted the same day to different people who had no communication with each other, which to me is just verification that when an energy comes into the world, it becomes available. So yes. three minds in three it different is. countries picked up this patent idea and, and got a patent at the same time, which so shows the energy was available. And so when someone like you does the work you've done, when you look at the trauma you've been through and you step into the willingness to do the work you've done, that's like what it makes available to the world is that's, Exactly what the physicist Yeshua was saying when he said a little leavening leavens the whole loaf. So yes. it's going to take a certain number of people doing that to make that available and the, and the amplitude of the energy of it to be strong enough to become universally available. Seven and a half billion miles. Which has been my goal. You know, Alex has been my great motivator through all of this to heal the generations. It has, yeah. that's, that's been my motivation because I, of course, want the best for him. He's my yeah. precious base boy. <laughs> yeah. I'm just uh, 
looking. I'm sitting here at the kitchen table, and uh, Jamie just got uh, several copies of her new book, which is Healing Generations One Breath at a Time. So I'm looking at the cover of her new book as she's uh, working on some final oh, wow. editing. Yeah. When, so Healing when Generations. Does, that's um, it. When is that released? I've been really – I contacted one of my old social work teachers to ask him if he was doing anything on generational trauma, and he said he hasn't done it for years. So I've been looking mm-hmm. for that. So when are you guys looking at releasing that? Well, uh, Jeannie's working on it. I don't know what her schedule is at this point. Uh, I think it's oh, Cindy Penn. Okay. She just got the uh, the – the printed copy of it a couple of days ago, so starting to work on some final editing. Can I be the first purchaser? <laughs> I'm sure she'd be happy. <laughs> All right. I'll have to ask her. Um, but well, I am there she loving is. playing in this energy. Um, you know, it used to tick me off when you'd say, you want to come play? And... <laughs> It's like I'm just loving playing in this energy. It's fantastic. I understand. I understand. Once you realize it's there to be done, like to me, what else is there to do? Like what else is important? Right. Nothing. Right. I mean, we've got to eat and all that sort of thing, but what else is important? Yeah. Nothing else. And that's something else I was thinking about talking about the love filter and fear and hostility. I mean, ultimately, there's only love. It's just the perception that screws it all up, right? That's it. That's the truth of it. Because that love, when the maintenance woman comes in and makes the corrections, you know, it was all motivated by love in the first place. Yep. That's That's what's behind it all. Yep. I just want to thank you again. Life is good. Honored and delighted and glad to be on the team. Thank you. All right. Lots of love and blessings. Take care. Thanks. Oh, amazing on that one. Miss Jeannie? Do we have anybody else in the phone queue with a hand up? We've got about 10 minutes left. There are no other hands up, but I will say, um, I don't know that Celinda is, no, she's not back on yet, but I'll send her an email. But I'm putting a list of the workshops that we got on DVD that we have played on the radio show um, for so right. people can go back and do a search for the titles. So I've made a list of those. And then also for Cami, um, we've got a page on the website about Rocket, Rockma and Cuba. And so I've got a link for that in the notes for today as well as a link for the Getting the Stress You Need Schematics of the Mind. And uh, then at the bottom of every worksheet is the definition for Ruka de Kutcha. And that's all. I've been putting that, all that in yeah, while that's you've all. been talking. <laughs> that's all, right. <laughs> Thank you for handling so much, sweetie. <laughs> and, uh, Cami, I sent you a, a note that um, on Facebook as soon as um, – eh, I'm trying to find – as soon as it's available, I'll let you know. It will also be announced on Facebook. And so I just sent you a copy of the front of the book. And so we'll be talking sure about it here, can, too. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Um, we do have a hand up. Great. And I don't have this number in my phone book, so I'm not sure who it is. 903, you are on the air. Who do we have? Hi, can you hear me? You're loud and clear. Excellent. Hi, this is Rome. How are you all doing today? Hey, welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. Delighted. Well, uh, I'm calling in today. I uh, missed the, uh, some of the first end of the show, uh, caught all of the second half, uh, so I'm not sure if it was covered, probably not. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. in regards to some of the work, 
that uh, we all need to do. Um, not right. pertaining to the book, but, uh, you know, the worksheet. Um, mm-hmm. I have a question for you. Uh, Go for in it. In regards to, okay. Um, so when it comes to working on ourselves and really forgiving and learning these techniques, they're not, I can't say that I have uh, experience in the way that I'm looking to gather it. It, I'm sorry, I have uh, my daughter with me today. So she's, uh, oh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, what age is she? she? Might, or should I say, uh, how long has she, she been circling the sun? Uh, well, she's, uh, let's see, today is the 4th, so tomorrow will make eight months. <laughs> oh, wow. What a precious time. She is, uh, she is amazing, and it's really shown me a lot, uh, which... Anyone who's a parent, I'm sure, can attest to uh, my first child. But I I tell you what, in listening to the last listener and hearing about some of the work that she's been doing and your attribution um, to that and her uh, walk, um, I, I just think it's an amazing thing that she's not only doing for herself, as you already said, but what she's doing for the world at large and every person. That's one person, but yet, I mean, all for one, one for all. I mean, I don't know how people see it, that's but it. I kind of see it all as we're all connected to the same source. We all are the source. We're not the source, but a part of the source, the drop, but not the ocean. That's it. Right? Um, yes, but, uh, you know, and I applaud her for that. I'm looking to do some of the same things because we all have got a lot of trauma, and I think some of us get so used to um, being hurt and, you know, just constantly having to adapt that chaos is normal <laughs> so you don't yep. realize yep. how much you got going on sometimes until you mm-hmm. fall apart, uh, as you were saying, uh, which has happened to me a time or two. But uh, to to my point, um, I've recently uh, found out, well, let me just ask you, when it comes to um, forgiving and all the things that go into the process, according to the Aramaic, um, do you have any experience with someone who has dealt directly with uh, or has told you that they were dealing with, you know, something as ADD or ADHD and yes. how that might apply to this? Okay. Yes. Uh, My take is ADHD is a defense mechanism against attack. It's a state of hypervigilance where, gee, I don't do very well in school because here I am sitting here and I have to keep my eyes open to make sure somebody doesn't blindside me. So how can I listen to a teacher? How can I be interested in this subject or that? And they say, oh, well, you just have attention deficit. No, I'm taking care of myself and make sure somebody doesn't destroy me. That's my take on ADHD. And so it's based in fear and worksheets around that will tend to process that out. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to get your take on it because it's new for me. I uh, am approaching 40 and have never uh, known these things directly. Had some signs back when I was in fourth grade, this, uh, the other, and I think I've fallen through a lot of cracks. Uh, right. Just because, you know, uh, I guess you learn to uh, adapt. And um, right. you just fall through a lot of cracks. So I'm just figuring it out after, like, all this stuff has unwound in life, car accidents, all sorts of things. Um, and I'm told that, you know, you can make it through your whole life until, like, something extremely stressful beyond what you've dealt with before can bring it about. So now that right. here we are. Then to create enough, enough goals and stress to give you those kinds of opportunities. Oh, but she's been the blessing in it all, though. I feel like she's been oh, a yes. leveling factor. <laughs> but but remember that stress is not a problem. Stress is not uh, a bad thing. Stress is a wonderful thing. Without stress, we'd all be dead. But having a child come into your life with all the wonderful pieces of the puzzle create or gives you reason to create a lot of goals, and every time you create a goal, you create a stress. That's not a bad thing. However, what happens is... 
when we allow ourselves to become ultra stressed, you know, we have a, one of the worksheets in our Laws of Living class is called a Mind Goal Management Sheet, which is designed to help you to manage your stress so that you don't reach the state where you get into power person dynamics. Because when somebody becomes ultra stressed, the mind will begin to prompt them to do behaviors that their power person did to them that were not very nice. Uh, and it's not because of anything bad. It's just if we allow the stress level to get too high, again, stress being an absolutely necessary part of life, we thought it would be dead. But if we allow it to get too high, that's when we start to go into those other parts of the mind that are in need of healing. I've I've sent you a, a set of links. I texted you a set of links, which will take you through the Y workshop and a couple of other things. I also sent you a uh, a little piece that I wrote on what our granddaughter, who's now five and a half, has taught us. We've been taking care of her from, you know, when uh, our kids had the baby. They both had three months of maternity leave, so we didn't see much of her the first three months. But since then. Since that first three months, we've had her two to three, sometimes four days a week. And uh, she's been one of our most awesome and wonderful teachers. And so that's uh, part of the, the learning process of, of kids. What, what she'll teach you will be awesome. And, uh, and I'm gonna, I've, I don't have it on this phone. I actually just changed phones. Uh, but I'll, I'll look up and I'll send you a link on... The, challenge, the challenges and the resolution of sympathetic dominance, which is what I hear you talking about. And moving out of the sympathetic state, fear, fight, flight, freeze, fawning, into parasympathetic, which is deeper rest, deeper digestion, higher brain function, and uh, healing. So I'll send you a link to uh, a training I did for the Avison Corporation for their medical professionals on, on that uh, idea. Uh, I appreciate that greatly, um, and I know we're approaching the end. Uh, so if you could just real quick, um, I'm just recent connect connecting with you all uh, not too long ago. Right. Um, I'm looking, uh, y'all are beyond where I'm at with the book. So it sounds like y'all have a Facebook group. What's the best way to connect? Because that's actually something I'm looking to do now. Uh, I'm very busy, but, you know, I don't want that to keep me from, like, making the right relationships and connections. So right. what would be uh, the best way you see to connect with, um, you know, what you all are doing to other people that, you know, are following uh, this past uh, well, the best way uh, betterment. The best way is through the radio show. You know, this conversation okay. on the radio show is the best way to do it. Uh, okay. We do have, you know, if you turn, you want to go to another level. We do have intensive uh, workshops. We have a mind shifter still point breathing club that meets monthly. So there's some other ways too. But uh, if you want to go ahead and just look at those links that I sent you, and uh, and then we can communicate from there and see what support we can be. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Hey. Delighted and honored to be supporting your family and especially that new little one and, and helping to welcome her into a world that is going to be awesome for her.